I'm Todd Neal, MedPage Today. In the United States, more than 98% of diagnostic and interventional coronary catheterizations are performed using the femoral artery as the access point. But transradial access through the wrist is used for about 40% of procedures in Europe and Asia, with much higher rates in certain regions. Interventionalists who prefer the transradial approach point to the significant reduction in bleeding complications compared with femoral access and the potential for same-day discharge. Dr. John Coppola of St. Vincent's Hospital in New York adopted transradial access for catheterization in 2003 after a week of training in India, where the technique is much more common, along with one of his colleagues. Uh, when we came back from India, both uh, Dr. Kwan and I were convinced that this was a uh, procedure that potentially was safer, but also more comfortable for the patients. Uh, if you had someone who had back pain, someone who had uh, a man with prostate problems who had a problem urinating lying down, you didn't have to confine him to bed for six hours after doing a femoral procedure. We were able to get the patients up immediately after the procedure. In fact, the thing that intrigued us in India was the patients would often get off the table and walk to their rooms. So, you know, for the safety aspect, for the patient convenience, or for the nursing convenience, the ease of care, we decided this is something we wanted to commit ourselves to doing. Dr. Kapola and other interventionalists who have adopted the transradial approach acknowledge that there is a learning curve at the beginning. Dr. Kapola estimated that it would take about 500 procedures to really feel comfortable and overcome the learning curve. As experienced as you are as an angiographer, there is a learning curve for doing radial procedures. Uh, the access is a, a little bit more difficult, as you saw this morning, the artery being a little bit smaller, so it takes a little bit uh, different technique to access the artery. And occasionally the radial arteries will have loops and bends in them that make negotiation of those loops and bends a little bit more um, challenging. In the beginning, you have to expect a certain rate of failure, either not being able to cannulate the radial artery or not being able to cannulate the coronary arteries because of difficult anatomy. And as time goes on, your failure rates become less and less. Although Dr. Coppola has begun teaching his fellows from their first year on how to perform catheterization using transradial access, uptake has been slow in the U.S. as a whole. And I think the reason is that uh, in the United States, many cardiologists will do multiple things. They'll be busy office cardiologists, they'll be doing stress tests and echoes, and they'll be coming into the hospital to do maybe two cats a year or th uh, two cats a, a week or three cats a week. So someone who's doing 100 cases a year says, if I have to learn a new technique and it's going to take me five years to master the technique, why bother? I didn't learn this during my fellowship. I learned how to do femoral procedures during my fellowship. I can do those in my sleep. I'm not going to bother learning a new technique. So I think that that's one of the things that is different in the United States. When you go to Europe, when you go to Asia, cardiologists there, for the most part, are working in a cath lab. They're angiographers. So all day they're in the hospital. So if they want to learn how to do transradial procedures, if you're doing a thousand procedures a year, it's going to take you six months of commitment to do this. There is an additional limitation to using transradial access in terms of equipment size, according to Dr. Coppola. Procedures that require a larger seven French guiding catheter would likely force the use of femoral access in both smaller men and women. But, he said, size limitation would affect a minority of procedures. You probably can do over 90% of your procedures transradially. He said the hardest part of transitioning to primarily a transradial approach is getting the technicians and nurses in the lab to buy into the idea. When you first do a, a radial procedure, since you're trying to learn the procedure, it's going to take you a little bit longer. So you have to have your staff buying into the fact that long term this is going to be advantageous for them and for the patients. And it really does make the post-procedure care a lot easier for your nursing staff. So once they realize that and once they see the patient confident and the ease, they start to uh, accept this procedure and buy into it. And, uh, you know, in the beginning when we were doing this, our nursing staff would say, oh, no, that's setting up for another radio case. After we got competent in it, we would come into the room and they would have somebody all draped and set for us to do a radio case and would say, we can't do this as a radio case because of this reason or this reason. And I'd say, oh, and they would be disappointed. Recent studies have shown that bleeding worsens the prognosis after a coronary intervention, and since the transradial approach reduces bleeding, it would be expected to improve clinical outcomes, according to Dr. Coppola. He believes this idea is increasing interest in the technique. So I think all of this data that's coming out now about the effects of bleeding on long-term prognosis after a coronary intervention and the decreased bleeding risk with radial have sparked a new interest in this country in transradial procedures. 
He said up to 50 physicians at a time are on a waiting list for the transradial training program at St. Vincent's, but because of his everyday work responsibilities, including training fellows, he can't accommodate all of them. The From New York, I'm Todd Neal, MedPage Today.